Thanks, and poor evening, ladies and gents. The tax-free savings account came in last year uh, when then Finance Minister Nkhlan Nene at, bu- at his budget speech introduced it. Um, and... and Tax-free savings account. What's important is we're calling it, the phrase is savings account, but in truth, it's an investment account. It really is around investing. And we're now a year into that process, almost a year into that process, and it has been, as, as Paul just said, it's been, it, it, it's worked. It, it's worked in the sense of, of people are signing up for it and the like. But most importantly, what the tax-free savings account does is you know, every year the, the finance minister stands up and you know, no disrespect, he takes money from us, right? He ups taxes, he charges us more in our fuel levy, he charges more for our cigarettes and our whiskey and, 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 and everything else. Um, and he very seldom really gives anything back. There was a small window towards the end of Trevor Manuel's term where we were getting effective tax cuts, uh, but that window is now being closed for a bunch of reasons. We don't need to dwell into that. This really is an opportunity where we've been given money back from government. And, and the short answer is we must grab it with both hands and, and take as much of it as we possibly can. This evening we're going to look at the processes. I've got a bunch of the frequently asked questions I've had over the course of the year, and then we'll open the floor to questions as well. But just a quick recap, it is really a tax-free. There, there is no tax. So you don't pay dividend withholding tax. At the moment, if you receive a dividend from a JSC listed company, 15% goes straight to SARS, the remaining 85% goes to you. I think We'll see that rate increase at the budget speech later this month, um, where now Finance Minister Praveen Gordon will increase that probably to maybe 20%. It's, it's nice, it's easy, it's clean, it's politically palatable. I think we'll see the dividend withholding tax. We don't pay any tax on interest. At the moment, if you earn interest, you get that first amount that is free. Depending on your age, it'll increase, but you're still paying that tax on the interest. And the, the trick with that, particularly if you're in a high tax bracket, is you're frankly being killed pay the tax, you take the inflation, um, and you're really not going very far at all in, in that process. No capital gains tax. If you buy an asset and sell it, with it after three years, uh, SARS would charge you capital gains tax. That's a third of your marginal tax rate. Your first 30000 a year is tax-free. Your primary residence is not included in the process within certain limits. The point being is, and again, I think we'll probably see an increase in CGT in the budget speech, but we don't pay capital gains tax. And that's, that's a fair biggie in a sense. The dividend one's not insignificant getting an extra 15% on every dividend uh, that we don't then have to pay tax on, and then being able to reinvest it and compound it over a lifetime, that's massively significant. We don't pay any income tax, which is really only applicable if you're doing short-term transactions. Quick important point within the tax-free savings account is you can transact as often as you want within a tax-free savings account. And I'm going to come back to that. But you, can, you, you don't have to buy and hold forever. You need to leave the money within the account, but you can take that transaction and you can have purchased one and then decide you want to sell it and, and, and go somewhere else. And there's no tax liability. If you did that within a normal uh, trading or investing account, there would be tax liabilities on those sales. And then no uh, security transfer tax, 0.25%. Every transaction on the buy side, the buyer pays a quarter of a percent, again, to National Treasury. So they, they, you know, some are more significant, dividend capital gains. Some are slightly smaller, perhaps. But the point is, it is completely and absolutely, as it says on the sticker, no tax. It is a tax-free account. And that's huge. There is one issue. Upon your death, it goes into your estate, and it is then going to be subject to estate duty. My view is quite simple. I'm dead. I have bigger problems. But aside from death, there is no tax to pay. During your lifetime, there is no tax to pay. The criteria is, of course, twofold. Firstly, it has to be within a tax-free savings account. We'll touch on that in a moment. And it has to stay within the tax-free savings account. When you pull it out, it's no longer protected from being tax-free. And it is, of course, post-tax. So you earn a salary, you pay tax on the salary, then you put proceeds into the tax-free savings account. So it is a post-tax process. Ability to open, short answer, anybody. No companies, no trusts, no PTYs, no CCs, nothing, no partnerships, but as it, at an individual level, anybody can open a tax-free savings account. You do not need to have a tax number. You do not need to be a South African resident. None of those rules are applicable. SARS has just said, you know what, if you want to open it, you know, so someone could fly out from London, those balmy army folks who were rampaging about 23 to the pound, um, they can come and open a tax-free savings account if they so wished. It absolutely is any individual can open a tax-free savings account. 
One of the, the big issues is around children and minors under 18s, and they certainly can open a tax-free savings account. If they're under 18, the FICA documents would be done either by uh, parents or the, the legal guardian, whoever that may be. There is a, a small bit of complexity. So a stockbroker cannot open an account for someone under the age of seven. So if you've got a, a child under seven and you've tried to open a, a, a tax-free savings account with a stockbroker, it has been declined. But you can open them at banks and financial service providers and other platforms. It's just it, it's a, 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 a legacy of the legislation around stockbrokers and the like. So if you've got kids who are under seven, um, you can. You just need to do it with a bank and FSP or something like that. So we can open it for anyone. So if you've got a, a spouse and, and, and three kids, uh, that's 150000 a year that can go into it. You can, you can max out those. The question comes, so the children's quite simple. They don't need a bank account or anything. The way the process is going to work is that when they want to withdraw the money from the tax-free savings account, Treasury says it must go into a bank account in their name. They don't need the bank account now, but when they want to take the money out, they're going to need to have a bank account to move the money into a bank account in their name. So that's the key issue. And right now, as I said, you do the FICA documents. There's no complexities with opening the tax-free savings accounts. The question then, step on from that, is, is, is do we open them for the kids? And, and, and I, I, I'm betwixt and between. I've I got a niece and a nephew, and I've been buying them ETFs since they were born, and they're respectively five and seven years old. Um, and my concern is that as soon as they hit 18, they have access to this account because I can't put it within a trust. So as soon as they have 18, they have full access to this account. And no disrespect, I was once 18, right? I know exactly what they're going to do with it. I mean, at best, at best, they're going to buy a fancy car and go to university. At worst, they're going to go to Europe and at 23 to the pound, blow it in two weekends. And that's fine. They're adults. They're technically allowed to. The problem is, is that now they're 20 and they've used up their tax-free savings account. And that might be the challenge to it. So the, and that then, to me, is the question which I haven't yet resolved. Do I continue buying them ETS, which I can put in a trust and control, and let them, at the age of 20, open a tax-free savings account and decide how they want to go with it? And I suppose it's going to be, you know, it's an individual question, but that certainly is an issue. As soon as they turn 18, they have a legal access to the money. They can do with it as they want. We no longer have control over it. You could, of course, not tell them about it. That might be considered bad parenting. I'm not a parent, so I'm not sure on that at all. Um, but short answer, anyone can open it. As long as you can do the FICA documents, you can open yourself a tax-free savings account. So then the question is, what are the limits? So there are restrictions. There are a bunch of them. The first limit is you're limited to 30,000 Rand per year per individual into a tax-free savings account. Fairly chunky. I think for the vast majority of people, they probably don't have 30,000 lying around or 2,500 rand a month. But you are limited to 30,000 per year. An important point, I say profits don't impact limits. Let's say you put in 30,000 and you grow to 33. Your deposit was 30,000. So you haven't now pushed that limit at all. Even if you then sell when it's at 33 and now you've got the cash, you deposited 30. The way they work it is the money's being deposited into the account is what matters. So 30,000 a year per limit. If you exceed that limit, SARS will tax the excess at 40%. And that is onerous. So I ran the numbers to try to work out, you know, could I put 10 million in and pay the 40% and would I get ahead? No. SARS gets ahead and I just get, yeah. I pay a large amount of tax. Um, so do not exceed the limit. And it's a self-regulating limit. In other words, the institution that you are doing a tax-free savings account is not going to manage that limit for you. There's a simple reason. There's two. One, it's just practically difficult. But more importantly than that is you can have a tax-free savings account with two different providers. You can have it with 10 different providers if you so wished. Um, and your limit is then 30,000 across all of the providers not per provider. So you can't go open a TFSA with six different providers and put 30 into each. So if you've got 10 different providers, you've got to do 30,000 across the 10 at max. And the provider has no idea how many other accounts that you have. Importantly, it runs tax here. So 1 March to 28, 29 February. So we've got, uh, what are we down to? Today's the 11th. We've got about another dozen days or so um, before this tax year is over. So we're still sitting in year one of your 30,000. 
come 1st of March, which is a Tuesday, you're now in the new year and you've got a new 30,000 that you can do over the course of that 12-month period. You don't have to do it with any form of regularity. You can do 30,000 at one shot. You can do 2,500 a month. You can do 500 rand this month and 600 next month and zero the month after. There's no regulation in that sort of environment. Obviously, there's costs. We'll touch on those and the like. You also have a 500,000 lifetime limit. So 30,000 per year. And once you've deposited 500,000 into your tax-free savings account, which at 30,000 a year is going to take you about 17 years to do, that's it. You cannot put more money in. And that's the issue, as I mentioned a moment ago, with, with kids. So it depends you know, if you're only putting small amounts. But if you're maxing them out, when they hit somewhere in their late teens, they're going to have potentially have hit that 500,000 lifetime limit. The question is, will those limits change? And I think they will. But I'm not sure. If we look at the similar product, which is in the UK, um, they've raised the limits to really, you have to be, I don't know, Donald Trump to have the limit be an issue. Um, for the vast majority of people, the limits are well in excess of their net wealth. But I think what we're likely to see is limits that are increasing at uh, sort of broadly inflation adjusted. You know, so move from 30,000 to maybe 31 or 32,000, something like that, slowly over time. So in truth, when we get 20 years down the line, that 500,000 limit might be six or 700,000 over that period of time. But it's going to take us a while to get there. And, and, and the logic behind it is, <clears throat> is that, you know, this is not meant to be a product for the one percenters who can come in and take their vast amount of wealth and helicopters and yachts and, and Greek islands and drop it into a tax-free savings account and benefit massively. It really is meant to be for, for, for the average private individual who's, who's you know, working away and got a bit of cash they need to save every month and a nice, convenient, cheap and tax-effective tax way of saving that money. And it, and it works, as the sticker says. It, it has been working in, 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 in that sense. C cash deposits only. So you can't take existing product that you have and insert it into a tax-free savings account. Again, that may change at some point. I'm not sure. But at this point, you can only deposit cash. So, I mean, I had a scenario with, with my sister. She had ETFs. I sold them, moved the cash into the tax-free savings account, and then rebought them. And it's, it, it, it's a bit of a process. It's not the most elegant way of doing it. Um, but it, 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 it worked, and it, and it happens. But you've got to move cash in. And the trick, I suspect, is that if you're moving existing product in, there's issues around the valuations of them. Yeah, and you move it today, and it's 30000 But tomorrow, it goes up in value, so it arrives, and it's worth 31000 And now SARS wants to penalize you. Or it falls to 29, and it gets messy and complicated. So the cash component might stay for some period of time still, where you can only move cash into that account. And then the big issue, what can we buy? So we can buy exchange-traded funds. There's some other products. You can buy collective investment schemes. You can put cash into it. Uh, there's some structured products that you can buy and the like. But I'm going to focus on exchange-traded funds for a bunch of reasons. First, let's step back a moment. What is an exchange-traded fund? So let's look at the, the collective investment scheme as a concept. And that's a, a, a regulatory process. And under that falls your unit trusts and your exchange-traded funds. Unit trust, most of us are probably familiar with. They take a grouping of, of people's money. They pool that money. They create units. They invest that money on your behalf as a collective. And if they do well, the value of the unit goes up. And if they do poorly, the value of the unit goes down. And we get that. And what they're really trying to do is they're trying to do better than what the stock market is. And what I mean by better is that if the stock market is doing 15%, they're trying to do 17 or 18%. The problem is twofold. Firstly, if you've got a group of people all investing in the same, you know, the same universe, i.e. the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the JSC, a whole bunch of you investing in the JSC, only half of you can beat the average. Now, there's an average. Half of you are above it. Half of you are below it. So we'll take that half and say, sorry, ladies and gents, you didn't crack it. You folks were above the average. We take it a step further, though. Once we bring costs into account, we discover that only about 15% one five percent of general equity unit trusts beat the market over the medium term, three to five years, which means it's the six of you up front here, which suddenly means, uh, yeah, how do you choose which they are? 
So the exchange traded fund industry, which came along, it started in North America in the mid-90s, started in South Africa in November 2000 with Satrix, a brand many of us, I'm sure we are aware of. And Satrix came along and said, you know, exchange traded funds say it's great to beat the market. But is it sustainable? Is it possible? Can we really do it over the long term? Why don't we just instead match the market? We know that over the long term, the stock market is the best performing asset class. As a basket, it gives the best performance. So the exchange traded fund says, well, brilliant. So why don't we create a top 40 exchange traded fund? All they do is they take your money, exactly the same as a unit trust would do. But rather than being selective as to what you will buy, they just buy you the 40 biggest companies in the market, put it in a basket, and sell you the basket. So you've got all the banks. You've got the, the, the telcos, um, those that are listed. So you've got Vodacom and MTN. You've got the retailers, Woolies, uh, Mr. Price is up there as well, um, ShopRite, et cetera, et cetera. And you get that basket. And as the market is, is, is rising, is going higher, your basket's increasing in value. And as the market is, is going down, which it does from time to time, your basket is decreasing in value at the same time. The point being is forget the short-term gyrations of the stock market. You know, over the long term, markets go up. And over the long term, our market is given a 15% per year return, excluding dividends, making it the best asset class we have for an investor or a saver in this country. Because they're just buying mar the, the, the market, they can do it for very low cost, high transparency, very simple, JC traded, so cheap fees, cheap platform fees, cheap internal costs. They don't need to employ analysts and all of those sort of people to decide which stocks to buy. So it just gives you an average. And, and in truth, I mean, no one's jumping up and down and saying, me, me, let me be the average. I get that. We all want to be exceptional. We're special. Our mothers told us, and our mothers were completely correct. The point being is that in the stock market, the average is a beautiful place to be. The average creates wealth. That, that, you know, the risk is, I always say to people, the biggest risk to a portfolio is you, the individual. That we go and buy African Bank at 40 Rand and watch it go bankrupt. That we buy Kumba Iron Ore at 600 Rand and watch it go to under 60. That we buy Lonman at 1,800 Rand, split adjusted, and watch it go down to 15 Rand. And there's a bunch of reasons why we buy the wrong ones and why we're unable to sell. Uh, a lot of them are around cognitive biases and the like. But we're the risk more than anything else, more than what Janet Yellen said last night or the, the Swedes going negative interest rates. And, uh, we're, the, we're the ones who make the mistakes. In this case, the average, is a, the average creates wealth. Now, people say to me, how do you get rich? Well, there's only one way we get rich in a hurry. Right? We marry money. How do you get rich slowly? Getting rich slowly is the simplest thing in the world. Spend less than you earn, take the difference, buy an ETF, come back in some decade's time. Simple as that. Creating wealth is just about knowing which the product is, ETFs, and then giving it the time. And I appreciate the time. We're in a hurry. We've got plans for Friday. We'd like some money for Friday afternoon tea time. Um, but this is not it. Uh, this is a process that will take time. But it will create wealth. That it will do. Without a shadow of a doubt, it will absolutely do it. So that's what ETFs are. Low-cost basket, baskets of shares. Methodology, as I mentioned a moment ago, so a top 40 methodology says quite simply, we take the 40 biggest companies in the JSC. And if one of those companies hits trouble times and starts falling and is now only the 45th biggest company, they boot it out the basket and they bring the new winner in. So in a sense, it's almost autocorrecting. And then we've got, you, know, you can go for ones that pay high dividends. You can go for ones that are offshore. You can go for niche ones such as a resource or an industrial or financial and the like. And I'll touch on those on the next slide. But it's going to create wealth. And with that tax saving, and I've got some numbers in a moment, it becomes significant wealth given that time. So those are the 39 exchange-traded funds, ETFs that are available within a tax-free savings account. There's some that are excluded. I'll touch on them in the next slide. But what we can see is actually a fairly good diverse range. So top left up there, we've got the international ETFs. So next take the top one, DBX US. The names are not sexy or catchy or anything like that. When they named these things, they did not consult the marketing department. What they do with that is, so it's administered by Deutsche Bank. They basically take your rands, you buy it in South Africa in rands. They take your rands, they convert it into US dollars. 
So you've immediately got a rand hedge. When our rand goes weaker, the value goes up. When our rand goes stronger, the value goes down. They then take those US dollars and they invest them into the 600 biggest companies in America. So it's the ones we know, Apple, uh, uh, you know, Facebook and the like. And then it's probably 550 companies we've never, ever heard of. But they're the 600 biggest companies and the largest economy in the world. And what you've got is pure offshore rand hedge exposure, nice and simple via an exchange traded fund. And they also, they've got the US, they've got UK, European Union, Japan, and then the Worldwide Fund. My preference, Worldwide Fund, I'll come to that later. We've got some property ones, the two different property ones that track the property index. Two key benefits of property. One, they pay a nice high dividend, that cash that comes out. And two, they're underpinned by solid assets in terms of a building. The assets are not intellectual property or anything like that. So property is usually more stable, although I, the usually is the important word there, perhaps. Equal weighted. I'm going to park that for now. I'll come back. All the different JC indices. So I mentioned we've got, for example, the mid-cap. So I spoke about the top 40, which is the 40 largest companies. The mid-cap are companies number 41 to 100 in terms of size which currently is dominated by mining companies because they've been falling out of the uh, uh, top 40 and moving into the, the, the mid-cap index. We've got the, the Indy 25, which is the industrial companies. We've got the Finney 15, which is financial companies, and the Resi 10, which is obviously resource stocks. So we can go fairly granular and fairly niche. We can say, we think the future is about resources. I, I don't do that at all. Because the, the short answer is, is, you know, over the next year, what's going to be the best sector on the JSC? I haven't a clue. And I've got some, 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 some guesses I'll give you. I'm pretty sure it's not resources. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not financials either. And I'm not even sure it's industrials. <laughs> it's going to be tough in the JSC this year. The thing being is that if we start saying it's resources, what happens if a year ago you said it was going to be resources? And a lot of people a year ago were saying that this is the year of resources. Except the index went down about 40%. So your 30,000 Rand is now you know, 18,000 Rand and is continuing to fall. The problem is, let's say you're right. Let's say it was about resources. At some point, it will not be. It will be some other sector. What I'm saying is you're going to have to actively manage it. You're going to have to make a decision that today it's resources, and in two years' time, sell the resources and buy the new hot sector. And what will be the new hot sector? Don't know. And that's not easy to do for the experts, never mind the amateurs such as us. And, and I'm not using amateurs in a disparaging phrase. I'm saying none of us can see the future. Whereas if you buy top 40, we've got all of those stocks in there. And when resources have a bad time, they fall out. And when resources start having a brilliant time, they come back in. So that basket of 40 shares, in a sense, self-corrects. As the new hot sector starts to happen, those stocks will move into the index. What we've got right now is a situation in South Africa where there are only three resource shares in the top 40. Three. Sasol, Anglo, BHP Billiton. Just five years ago, there were three in the top five of our market. Uh, the same, th same, it was SAS or Anglo Billiton. But Anglo Gold Ashanti, gone. Harmony, gone. Goldfields, gone. Uh, uh, Arsenal Mittal, gone. Uh, Kumba Iron Ore, gone. Anglo Platinum, gone. Lonman, gone. We've lost about 12 stocks. Because right now, the last thing you've wanted to hold for the last one, three, five years has been resources, and that top 40 auto corrects it. It's passive investing. Buy it, forget about it. Amount of effort required, less than opening a glass of wine, a bottle of wine. In fact, a bottle of wine is probably markedly harder to open than it is to make those decisions. You just buy the top 40, it'll look after itself. You're also saying to me, top 40, you've got to be kidding. Have you seen what's happening to GDP in South Africa? No, there's nothing to see. We don't have any GDP right now. The point being is that those top 40 companies earn about 70, 75% of their revenue from beyond the borders of South Africa. Let's take SAB Miller. Okay, it's delisting later the year, ABM Bev is buying it. So we think SAB Miller, we think, yeah, we know that. It's a South African company. We can go to Newlands or Bramfontein and see them make the beer and everything else. But actually, they're a global company. Only about 5 or 6% of the beer that they, the profit that they make is from South Africa. The rest of it is from the rest of the world. 
There are companies like Richmond who sell watches, and Richmond has a watch that sells for uh, uh, millions of pounds, which is hundreds of millions of rands. And they don't sell many of those in South Africa. They earn probably 99.9% .9 of their money beyond our borders. So the point is, we have a globalized stock exchange. The JSC is not South Africa. The JSC is just a platform which enables global companies to be invested into. So the top 40, although they're listed local, these are global companies. We've obviously got the debt instruments for those who are looking for the lower risk space, government bonds. We've got preference shares and cash. We've got some, what I call the bespoke instruments. So, for example, B Green, which includes stocks that have a high green rating. Uh, we've got Momentum. We've got a Sharia fund in there, a low volatility. So they give you less bad days because they're bouncing around. They supposedly are smoother. Um, the Givies, which are the ABSA products, which were ERAFIs and got converted. Givy is growth index, uh, growth intrinsic value index indexation. Um, we've got some balanced also from ABSA. So the balanced are interesting. Growth and Protect, what they do is they do the multiple asset classes within one fund. So the growth one's got a lot of equity, a little bit of bond, a little bit of cash. The protect one's got a lot of uh, bond, a little bit of equity, and a little bit of cash. Uh, we've got some dividend payers, uh, and then we've got one RAFI there, which is the Satrix RAFI Top 40. So from those 39, we can do anything in the sense that we can be as niche as we want. If we think that it's all about resources, we can go 100% resources, either with Satrix Revy, Resi or with the uh, uh, Givy Resi. So we can go if we want. Or we can go completely broad. We can do the portfolio allocation, which is fancy jargon for spread your money around. In other words, put some money in, in, in local equity, top 40. Some money in offshore equity, one of your data bank X trackers. Some money in debt instruments, which would be your NF Govies or RMB inflation linked. Some money in property, which would be your prop tracks or your prop tracks 10 and the like. So we can get our full diversification with just a handful of ETFs. What can't we put in? Exchange traded notes. So quick backtrack. Exchange traded funds, what I spoke about a moment ago. What the difference is between an exchange traded fund and an exchange traded note is that a note is lit a fund, they hold the assets, and if the company has any trouble, those assets are there, those shares exist, your basket is safe. Exchange traded note is in essence a, a debt, a, a promise to pay you the profit issued by one of the banks. Deutsche Bank, uh, uh, BNP Paribas, and uh, uh, Standard Bank are the issuers locally. There's a very good reason why they do exchange traded notes. For example, oil, uh, there's an ETN on oil, but it's not practical to, to store barrels and barrels of oil. You know, oil degrades, it's expensive to store. If you stick it down a mine shaft, you have seepage and you lose some. So what they basically said is no ETNs, no commodity ETFs either. So for example, New Gold is a physical ETF. It's ma managed by ABSA. They physically go and buy gold to back the ETF. But that was excluded by Treasury as well. No individual shares, no uh, uh, real estate investment trusts, no derivatives whatsoever either. So it really is that list of 39 ETFs, which, I mean, at first blush, going back a year when I saw a list of 39 ETFs, my first thought was, nah, not terribly thrilling. But in truth, I was wrong. Everything we need is right there. We can be as fancy or as simple as we want from within just that simple list of, of, of the ETFs. Important point that everyone asks about is what about withdrawals? Can we take our money out? The answer is yes. You can withdraw money whenever you want. Absolutely no problem. As much as you want, as often as you want. But, and this is a very, very big but, this is designed to be a long-term investment product. And when I say long-term, I'm measuring things in decades. So it's not designed to, you know, you're going to buy a house in two years, let's quickly pop some money in and draw it out. And the reason is quite simple, is that a withdrawal impacts your lifetime limit. Here's what I mean. So you, lifetime limit is 500,000. You've put your 30,000 in for this tax year. Your remaining lifetime limit is now 470,000. You then draw that 30,000 out and you take it with you. But your lifetime limit remains 470,000. So withdrawals impact 
your lifetime limit. The reason that you can do withdrawals is because, you know, so we take it. This is a long-term investment. This is designed for decades. But life throws us curveballs. The best plans can go awry sometimes. So what SARS is saying, or Treasury is saying rather, that if you need the money, you can access it. You can sell what you have in there, turn it into cash, withdraw the money, it's tax-free, and now you can do whatever you want with it. But it's not what the product is designed for. The ideal is to deposit the money and leave it there for as long as possible so that we can create the wealth on it. Very important point, selling within the TFSA is not a withdrawal. So you put your 30,000 in, you buy yourself some ETFs, and then you decide that you bought the wrong ETF, so you sell it. That's fine. The money is still within the tax-free savings account. And if you make a profit, that's fine as well. But if you draw the profit, it again impacts your lifetime limit. So whilst we can withdraw the money, the plan is very much to not withdraw the money. That is not the purpose of the product whatsoever. So who are the providers? Pretty much everybody in the industry. Um, it took some of them a, a fair bit of time to get on board, but by this point in the process, you know, pretty much everybody in the industry has a, has a product of type. The question is, is it a good product? And I'll tell you right now how to identify the good products. So if you've got a stockbroker, they probably offer a tax-free savings account. If you have a bank, they probably offer a tax-free savings account. Some of the banks offer pure cash tax-free savings account, and I'm struggling to think of anything more boring. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love cash, but cash is not investing. Um, you know, cash is for spending. So check what your stockbroker, what your bank has, and see what their offering is. Here's what I want. I want pure DIY. What do I mean by that? That my provider gives me a tax-free savings account, and I can buy whatever I want. What a lot of the providers have done is said, you buy a tax-free savings account, and you have to, we will buy for you. We will buy you this one and that one, and you have no choice. And my issue with that is that some of the offerings, I think, are, are wrong. I, I think the way they've structured it is simply wrong. And, 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 and that's my bugbear with it. So I want pure DIY, let me do what I want. And if you're thinking you're not sure what you would want, you're not sure how to make the decision, I've got a slide in a moment, I'll tell you what to buy. But you still want that DIY. Um, a lot of the providers are offering discounts for the month of February, which is not many days left in the month of February. But in essence, they're saying if you transact this month, you won't pay transaction fees. I know of four who are. I'm not going to mention names because I'll forget someone or upset or aggrieve someone. But the point is a bunch of folks are offering uh, uh, discounts. Check with your provider, see if they are. But you really want a nice, simple process for it. And then you want a, something that is cheap. We always want cheap. There are no free lunches. I get that, but we want cheap. So what we've seen is that they've discounted brokerage rates. So you're paying brokerage rates of around 0.25% in your tax-free savings account with no minimums. That's cheap. The industry average is closer to 0.7, 0.6. So you're getting really cheap there. Um, discount straight fees. Straight is electronic settlement. It's, uh, uh, you've got no choice. It's the same everywhere. But uh, straight came to the party, and in the tax-free savings account, you get discount straight. What we're also seeing is very low, or in many cases, zero admin fee, what we call a, a platform fee. So there's multiple fees in this industry, right? You pay to transact, you, you pay for the platform, you pay for all sorts of things. But in this case, what we're seeing is a lot of the providers are charging zero admin fee. And that's a huge deal. Even a half a percent admin fee every year for the rest of your life is going to make a significant difference when you come to cash this product in. So ideally, you want one that has a, forget a low admin fee, you want a zero admin fee on a tax-free savings account. There are some folks out there who are charging half a percent or one percent. Uh, you know, they, they, they're helping you decide what to buy, and for that privilege, they're charging you half a percent or one percent. And with all respect, they're ripping you off. They are absolutely ripping you off. It took them approximately 15 minutes to decide what ETFs you should have in your portfolio, and they're now going to charge you 1% for the rest of your life for 15 minutes of work? No. Someone's getting very rich there on very little work, and unfortunately, it's not us. 
And if I'm paying 1% for something, I want something really significant. Not just, oh, yeah, we picked three ETFs, ETFs and bought those ones for you. You're being ripped off. So you really want the DIY, you really want that zero admin fee. If they're going to charge you 10 bucks a year, that's fine. You know what? 10 bucks buys us nothing anyway. And you think 1% is nothing, right? 1% on 30,300 Rand. Yeah. And in 20 years' time, and you think when your fund is worth 12 million, 1% is now 120,000 Rand a year. And that's just in one year. You paid it the year before, and you pay it the year after. What is nice is that no performance fees are allowed. So a lot of the industry, particularly in the trust space, if they do well, they charge you performance fees. And the tax-free savings account treasury has said illegal, not allowed, no performance fees. So what sort of returns will we get? Now, this is not my math because I'm not putting my head on this block. I, 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 uh, Standard Bank did it for me and I thought, cool, I will steal their numbers. So if you have a problem, go find the blue bank, jump up and down with them. So what are their assumptions? Their assumption is that there's an annual growth rate of 15% a year. That's fair. Our market has given an annual growth rate of 15% a year over any 20-year over 20-year periods. Over long terms, we're getting 15% a year. They said evident, uh, annual dividend yield of 0.2%. I think that's a little low. I think our average is probably closer to 2.6, but I would rather err on the downside. That's fine. Happy with a 2% annual dividend yield. A brokerage rate of 0.25% which seems to be broadly in line with what the industry is charging. Some are charging a little bit more, maybe some a little bit less, but I'm happy with that. A zero admin fee, because that's exactly how much I want to pay for administration. Zero, my favorite number when fees are involved. And then they've assumed that you've put in the full 2,500 Rand a month, and this is classic banker. They assume that everyone's got 2,500 Rand a month just lying around, ready to be invested. The stark reality is that people don't. I mean, you know, I've been using 30,000 as an example throughout this evening. You know, you've put your 30,000 in. I appreciate the reality is that 30,000 is a pile of cash. And you can buy stuff and get change. <laughs> Depend, I mean, there's limits. I mean, yeah, I saw a 140,000 Rand TV the other day. Ain't no change from that. But you could buy a five grand TV and have change. So they've assumed that you've absolutely maxed it out and that you've done it until you've hit your 500,000 lifetime limit, and that those contribution limits have not changed over the next 25 years. And then your value over 25 years is 11.4 million rand. If you're paying 1% fee, you're paying 114,000 rand per year fee. 114,000 rand per year fee. If you want to pay someone 114,000 rand, I've got a bank account. I'll give you the details afterwards. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll even buy you dinner. McDonald's. Because I'm a cheapskate. <clears throat> of that 111.4 million, 500,000 came from your contributions at 200,000 Rand a month over 17 years and change. 8.8 .8 million came from good old fashioned investment growth and the dividends being reinvested. And 2.1 million is your tax that you saved. SARS just gave you 2.1 million Rand. I know this is in the future, power of time, etc., etc., etc. The point is that. A fair enough chunk of that, about 18% of your pile of cash, came because you were in a tax-free savings account. If you were in a regular investment account, you would not have that 2.1 million rand. It's real. This is the real McCoy, folks. This is no smoke and mirrors, no fancy things. This is how to make free money from the government. There ain't no other way to make free money from the government. So quick, some questions that I've, the, the most popular questions, I'll have some Q&A at the end, but the most popular questions I've had over the course of the last year and emails in the last couple of days, uh, Jonathan was asking lump sum or monthly, which is better? So the short answer is that although I prefer doing monthly contributions, right? Because, you know, so that as the market rises, I feel like a genius and as it falls, well, I buy some and the math tells you quite simply, lump sum is always better. Put the lump sum in. So what I did last year, 2nd of March, opened my tax-free savings account, put my lump sum in, invested it, and it went down. Hey, that's the market for you. The truth of the matter is, is that you're probably not sitting with 30,000 Rand burning a hole in your pocket, in which case, do the monthly. But if you do have 30,000 Rand or a pile of cash burning a hole in your pocket, deploy it immediately. If nothing else, while it's sitting there, 
it earns interest, that is tax-free. Whereas it is sitting in your bank account, it earns interest, that is taxable. Will we ever be able to buy individual shares was a question from Lebo, uh, Lebo Khan. And the answer is maybe, but there's going to be rules. So what Treasury said is you can't buy individual shares. Why not? Because they're terrified that you bought Lonman. I'm serious. Or African Bank. You know, I mean, you know, why not? And, and that's the problem. So, you know, let's go forward 15 years' time or whatever. Where are we? 25 years' time. And we've got 11.4 million rand. And we're rich. And we decide we want to be stinking rich. So we buy African Bank. And a day later, it's bankrupt. And our tax-free savings account is gone. So Treasury might do individual shares, and certainly there's some talk, but they're going to do it with some regulations. Eh? This is not going to be, they're not going to, they're going to be regulations. In the, in the immediate, no, and I don't expect that to change. Uh, Sipo was asking, my TFSA has lost money, what must I do? Simple, turn off your computer. <laughs> with no disrespect to Sipo, my TFSA has lost money too. Oddly enough, mine has lost money, my sister's has gone up in value. Well, I bought her different stuff. I mean, I'm just off. I bought her the good stuff, and I bought me the less good. Quite simply, one year is not an investment time horizon. One year is nothing. Things will go up and down. You know what? I expect it to go down again this year. But that's fine. We're not worrying about this year. We're not worrying about the next year. You know what? <coughs> Excuse me. We're not even worrying about 2020. We're worrying about 2030, 2040, dare I say 2050. Okay, not me, because I'll be way old by then, but you young folks are worrying about 2050, maybe even 2060. Markets go down sometimes. At the moment, that's exactly what they're doing. They go up over the long term. So your TFSA has gone down. My advice is, as I, I mean, I said it tongue-in-cheek, but you know what? Stop checking it on a regular basis. I checked mine today because I thought I should see how well. Actually, I checked mine because I was going to do a screenshot to show you how well I'd done, and it was red. <laughs> So I didn't do the screenshot. Uh, Jonathan asks, why is BBET40 doing so poorly? So BBET40 is my favorite ETF along with DBXWD. I know, jargon. I'll get to the jargon in a second. So let me explain to you what is BBET40. Better, beta, equal, weighted, 40. That didn't help you either, did it? <laughs> I mentioned a moment ago that they take the top 40 stocks. Okay. So what they normally do Satrix and the others, they take the top 40 stocks. But the bigger you are, the bigger you are in the, in the basket. So if you invest into a Satrix 40, what they do is you put 100 bucks in. They take 50 of it and buy you five companies. Sassel, excuse me. Actually, I don't know if it still is Sassel. So it's definitely British American Tobacco. It's definitely SAB Miller. It's uh, definitely NASPAS. And it used to be MTN and Standard Bank, but it's probably not. It used to be Sassel. It's probably not. It's probably Richmond. And they buy just half of your money into five shares. And you're like, well, that's great when those five shares are doing well, which they have been. NASPAS, done brilliantly. SAB Miller, done awesome. British American Tobacco, done spectacular. So what's happened is a couple of the large ones have done good. What BBET40 does is says we take those 40 stocks and we make every one the same. So when we take 50 bucks of your 100, we buy 20 shares. And the other 50 goes into the other 20. It's called equal weighted. What equal weighted means, everything's even in there. So the big ones go down and the small ones get up weighted. The impact is, the numbers will tell you that over the long term, it gives you about 1% a year better performance. And 1% a year is not un insignificant over the, but over the short term, it might not. And what we've seen in the short term, what are the stocks that have been driving our market in the last year or two? SAB. British American, NASPAS, the big guys. Will they, so top 40 has done better than better equal weight to BBET40. Will those stocks always be the best shares? No. Well, look, SAB is going to disappear one day when they get delisted because it's been bought out. But, you know, British American tobacco, will it always be the best performing stock in our market? No. When will it stop being the best performing stock in our market? I have absolutely no idea. So in the short term, you might do poorly. But in the longer term, this will be better than a normal top 40. So uh, Jonathan, don't stress if you own BBET40. So do I. That's what my sister didn't have. That's why she beat me. Uh, is it worth opening a TFSA? I'm 65. Uh, yeah. So a lot of folks have said to me, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, 65, 75, 85, 95, however old. 
and it's like, oh, what's the point? I'm not going to be around for much longer. Two things. Okay, if you're 95, you're really old. <laughs> Apologies to anyone who's 95. I hope, like heck, one day I'm 95, because then I've had lots of time to have fun. The point being is that, firstly, if you're 65, Michelle, you're going to live to be 90. You've got a 50% chance of making it to 90, which you've got the time. The point being is that even if you think that you've got few days left, why not make some money off the government for those few days? <laughs> Free money. You've been paying tax for 65 years. Get a slice back. Even if it's only a small slice, any slice is better than no slice. Uh, and then Marsha was asking, can we invest offshore in a tax-free savings account? No, but. So you, you've got to invest in JC-listed ETFs. But as I showed you a moment ago, you can buy those Deutsche Bank X trackers, which you can get Japan, Europe, UK, US, or worldwide. So you can, via some clever, not trickery, just some cleverness, you can invest offshore. But you can't literally take the money offshore. It has to be done in South Africa, in rands, but you can get that offshore exposure. So then the question is, which TFS, what, what products to buy? So I'm, I'm not going to charge you 114,000 rand per year for this information. Um, so last year in March of 2015, when I opened my TFSA, I bought Better BT Equal Weighted 40. That's the top 40 stocks. And I bought DBX Worldwide. And I did it 50-50. 15,000 into one. 15,000 into the other. What is DBX worldwide? So it's rather than investing in the US or Europe or Japan or the UK, because I don't know which of those is going to be the hot space over the next 20 years. I can tell you that in 2014, it was without a doubt uh, the US. Last year, it was Japan. Go figure. This year, I have no idea. So what the worldwide fund does is it invests in all of those territories. So at the moment, that worldwide fund is 50% in the US, 11% respectively in Europe, Japan, and uh, the UK, and then some other money in, again, developed markets, no emo emerging market exposure. And what will happen is, let's say Japan becomes the powerhouse, and over the next 20 years, Japan is the best economy. The Japanese weighting in that basket will increase, and the US weighting in that basket will decrease. So you get that global exposure, and again, it's passive. I don't have to try and predict who's going to be the winner going forward. I know that whoever wins will get a better slice of the action. So the reason my sister beat me last year is I bought those two for me 50-50. But my sister had a lot of those already, so I only bought her the DBXWD. And then the RAND went loop-de-loop, -loop, and my sister's account went droops, and she's got like 33,000, and I've got like 28. I'll charge her comp. So what am I buying this March? First of March, it's a Tuesday. I will put 30,000 Rand in. I'm still buying BBET40 DBXWD. I'm slightly skewing it towards DBX. I'm going to go 40, 60. And that, I mean, the question is why not just 50, 50? And it's a great question. And it's just, I think, that although that, that BBET40 has only got a quarter of its earnings coming from... Uh, uh, South Africa, from South Africa, the rest is offshore. SA Inc. at this point for the next couple of years is going to be a very, very tough economy. Some folks are saying to me, why don't you just go DBX? Because at some point, the RAND's going to get stronger. I know it's impossible to believe, <laughs> but think about December 2001, the RAND went to 1360 and then it went to 575. Think about December 2008, the RAND went to 13 and then it went to 675. The RAND is not a one-way bet. It never has been. Maybe it was in the 80s. I don't know. I was too young to know back then. The RAND is not a one-way bet. So I still want that little bit of spread. But then you want to take it really fancy. So I said, here's the, the, this is what you get charged 1% for. So an ETF portfolio, three different portfolios. The low risk is if you are in retirement. Medium risk is if you're less than 10 years to retirement. High risk, more than 10 years away to retirement. And those are your five. And I've gone way beyond what I've just bought. Now, I only buy two because my tax-free savings account, I've got a bunch of other investments around it as well. This is just a very small part of my investment universe. But if this is a large part of your investment unit, what have we got? We've got the BBET40. We've got NFGovi, which is the South African Total Return Government Bond Index, basically tracking government bonds. Nice, low risk. We've got DivTracks. 
which is a core shares product, core shares owned by Grinrod. And what that is trying to do is find you a nice stocks with high dividend yields. Currently gives you about a 4.5% dividend yield. We've got PropTrax 10, which is the 10 biggest property stocks in South Africa, and the DBX world. And what you can see, more than 10 years, high equity, less than 10 in retirement, lower equity. Is that rocket science? No. Is that the best possible uh, 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 split for investing? Honest answer? We don't know. Ah, you shrugged, so you're 100% spot on. People give you portfolios as if they can see into the future. We all have exactly the same ability to see into the future. Zero. What that is, so what can we do? It's balanced. It's nicely balanced across different asset classes, across geographies, across businesses and sectors and currencies. It's balanced. It's what I would call boring. And in the investment world, boring is beautiful. So 2016, we have a Sono tonight. We have a budget speech on the 24th. Will anything change? No. I do not expect Praveen Gordon to increase the limits. I think he has bigger challenges, and I think giving away money, although it's not directly giving away money, might not be the most prudent thing. Uh, I expect him to actually increase dividend withholding tax and capital gains and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, he desperately needs money to avoid a downgrade to junk. Um, so I'm not expecting any changes to limits. I'm not expecting any changes to can we buy shares and what we can buy. Pretty much, I think, 1st of March this year, it's going to be same old, same old. What will happen is that this, this year you've been unable to transfer a tax-free savings account. So you had a tax-free savings account with an institution and you wanted to move it to another institution, you were not allowed to. Come 1st of March, you will be allowed to. That's the key difference. So quick review, short answer, who should open it? Everyone. If you've got a heartbeat, open one. If you, children, we can, I mean, the children's perhaps a more murky debate, and I touched on that earlier, but short answer, open one. Critically important, ignore the short-term market gyrations. Markets go up, they go down. When they go down, we get all scary. Well, what happens when a market goes down? Our market is 15% down from where it was in November. What does that mean? It's called a sale. When Woolies has a sale, people queue. When the JC has a sale, people panic. No, man. This is called a sale. What are you getting? You're buying the same. You're getting more bang for your buck. Your money is buying you more. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, the Woolies sale, I mean, I love Woolies. I'm a shareholder. I spend far too much money there. But I always wonder, you know, why did no one else buy that? Now it's half price. But no one else wanted it. Here, you got stuff. It's cheap. Markets will go down. Is our market going to zero? I mean, there's very few promises I make you, but the promise is the market's not going to zero. Because if it does go to zero, the world is ending, and you're not going to be able to find me anyway. <laughs> no, we're going to be fleeing. So the market will gyrate. Things will go up, things will go down. Forget about it. Focus on the long term. And long term, as I've said already, is measured in decades. Best advice, don't even look. My sister doesn't even know what her tax-free savings account has done. I think she forgot that I opened one for her. That's the best type of investing. Keep it simple. There's no rocket science required here. Keep it cheap. Watch the costs. You know, we say, what's half a percent? What's one percent? Ah, how bad can it be? Uh, it's not bad on 30,000. It's bad on 11.2 million. So really, really watch the costs. And, 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 and shop around. As I said, everyone offers these products. Shop around for it. And then last point is fill up your TFSAs before other investments. So your first 30000 a year that you invest, put into your TFSA. If you have excess money to invest, then you can go and put into normal unit trusts, uh, or uh, unit trust, exchange traded funds, or go buy individual equity, whatever you want. But use the tax-free savings. The first 30000 every year, and this is obviously you've got pension funds and provident schemes and all of those type of things. Those are separate. But that individual investing you do, first 30000 every year, put in a TFSA. And if you've only got 12, well then the first 12,000 every year. Whatever the personal circumstances. But fill up the TFSA first. And then I go right to the top. Everyone should open one. You know, it's seldom, with respect to government, that government announces a product that actually is just like really good and got no problems. 
Now, I know you're looking at me like surprised. I'm like, I'm serious. Government made a product that is really good and has no problems. We should, as Paul said in the intro, and as we are doing, we should be flocking to this thing. You know, tell your friends. Okay, you won't be the most, you know, it's not exciting dinner conversation. But they'll love you when they're worth 11.2 million rand. Uh, contact details, legal stuff. Questions, ladies and gents. I've hopefully answered them because I only have 12 seconds left. But if there are questions, so. First question, is that the reason Manning would For this. No, there is a benefit for government. So the question is, where's the benefit for government? There's a real benefit for government. What they're doing is encouraging individuals to save. That takes a burden off government in our older age, a burden from a medical perspective and all of that sort of thing. Um, so that, that, that there's, I mean, you know, the government's never that altruistic. They, they score as well. What stops them from changing the rules in 20 years time? Short answer, nothing. No, I mean, they're the government. Uh, the only answer I can give you, there's nothing that will stop them changing the rules in 20 years' time. Christian. Sorry, sorry. Microphone. Yes, sir. How is this better than doing an RSA retail bond? So, so you can put a RSA retail bond in a tax-free savings account. The key benefit of an RSA retail bond is your capital is 100% guaranteed. The Money that you earn is taxable as interest unless it's in a tax-free savings account. The key difference is, is that RSA retail bond is a debt instrument, and debt typically, government debt as in our case, yields 8 or 9, maybe 9.5% nine per year. This is giving you 15%. So it gives you a better return, and that extra 4, 5, 6% per year over the rest of your life becomes significant. Where's my microphone? Sorry, you have it. Yes. Uh, if the limits go up over time, would you be able to retroactively invest? Ha! <laughs> Excellent question. I doubt it. No. So I think what they'll do is they'll increase the annual limit, say it goes to 31. So you can't go then and go and put in an extra one for last year. But at the same time, they'll increase the lifetime limit. So it just means that... It, so at the moment, if you do 30,000 a year, it takes you 16 years and 8 months to get to the, to, the, to the limit. As they increase that lifetime, it'll take you a little bit longer. So it'll take you 17 and 18 years. You won't be able to retroactively add it. There's a lot of talk around... I mean, there's talk around if you're 65 or older, the annual limit falls away and you can immediately go to the, to the limit. There's a lot of talk. But so far, this is all just talk. And I stress, this is not talk coming out of Treasury. So it might be wishful thinking. Uh, sorry, just a quick one. You said that from March, the first of March, you will be able to transfer from one. Yeah, from one provider to another. It, irrespective of the type of product. Let's say if you bought ETFs no. or unit trust. So, for example, let's say you have a unit trust tax-free savings account and you want to move it to your stockbroker. If they don't have the facility to do unit trusts, which most stockbrokers don't, you wouldn't be able to transfer it to them. If you've got a, a, a pure ETF with a stockbroker, you wouldn't be able to move it to an insurance company because they don't have the, the structure. So, there's still, I take your point, there's still going to be some limitations in a sense. What you will be able to do is if you've decided that you don't like the, let's say, unit trusts anymore, you could sell that down to zero and transfer the cash. So that you can then move into a, into a different provider in a sense. But there will be limitations in terms of where you're moving to, are they able to handle your investment? Ma'am. Um, if you want to open the account, where do you go? To the, let's say the BBET 40. Do you go to your bank and you say, I want to put 15,000 or whatever into the BBET 40? How do you do it? And then how do you work out the brokerage fees and these fees and those fees? No, fair point. So the first thing you do is if you've got internet banking, log on to your bank's internet banking and see if they've got a tax-free savings account product. Um, and I, th I mean, I th all but, I mean, three banks I know definitely have. Um, the others probably, and I'm just not aware of it. So first just log on there and see, and most of the banks have got it in nice big blazing colors because they want to do it. <laughs> How do you know what the fees will be and the like? So what you then do is you've, 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 you've then opened the account. And if you do it within your bank, it's easy. There's no fika. They know who you are. You move your 30,000 rand in from an electronic transfer, all done. 
the 30,000 is now there. Then they'll have a process that says, right, of these products, which do you want to buy? So you click on BBET40. It then says, how much? And when you say, I want to buy, and it turns out you want to buy 40,000, they're going to say, ha, ha, no, 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 you've only got 30. They will build the fees into that. So they will then show you, and they will detail it to you. They'll say, right, you're buying 926, and they're costing you this, and there's your fee and your other fee, and there's your total, and you'll have four rand left in cash. Click yes or no. So, I mean, in that case, so what I did this afternoon was a very quick ex experiment. I went into Google, I put in TFSA space czar so that it searched South Africa only, and there were all the, uh, there were pages and pages of the different offerings. So you can do all that searching from in front. If you then decide that you're going to a third party who you haven't used before, you open an account, you're going to have to do FICA, but it's a one-off process, then deposit the money into the equation. But a, a Google search got me a lot more than I expected to see. I would, I would recommend, I mean, if, if, if your bank offers a good product, I would go with your bank. And, and I'm desperately not naming names now, but if you chat to me afterwards, I can name some names. Um, <laughs> no, because I'll offend somebody. Um, if your bank offers, otherwise, because that's just easy in terms of moving money, in terms of FICA, that's always first price. So, Hello, I'll just like to find out what's the minimum amount. I know that with ETF SA, minimum is 300, and lump sum is 1,000. And then with the banks, well, the one that I bank with, the minimum is 500 if you want to buy. But um, the T ETFs through the banks, it's normally 500 rands. Yeah, so the limits are typically three to 500. That's not a legislated issue. That's an issue from their cost structure. There are, there are, there are, there are places which have zero limits whatsoever. Um, but because some of the costs are fixed, like straight is fixed at four rand. So if you did a five rand transaction, you pay four rand to straight, you invest only one rand, you're paying it all in fees. So, so a lot of them have put limits of three or 500. Um, but there are some lurking that don't have any limits. Last question, sir. Hello, Simon. Um, for these TFSA accounts, I understand obviously that one slot of 30,000 Rand, can, you can only open up one of those accounts per annum. Is that correct? So you get one chance, one year, the 30,000 Rand maximum. That, okay. No, so you could open okay. three accounts, 10,000 yes. per each. Okay, that's fine. Now, the next question that I have is that when is it the right time to close that account? Do you wait the full term of 12 months? Or should we say that, uh, great, we've got 17%, which is 2% higher than the 15 or on average. Yes, let's get out now and take our money. Hmm. <laughs> Short answer is I would just leave it. Longer answer, and I've seen some folks doing it, but people are starting to trade in their TFSA. So in the first year, it's hard. It's only 30,000. But you go and buy the Japanese Deutsche Bank one does spectacularly well. Now you're not so excited by Deutsche Bank, so, by Japan rather, so you sell it and you go buy whatever the new one is, and you can absolutely do that. In terms of shifting between the different funds and saying, we think this provider is no longer going to cut it and we want to move to that provider, I don't think it's about time because you know, sometimes someone can do great for one year, sometimes it's five years. It's going to be a, take a fair bunch of homework on your side to see you know, why they're doing great. Does it look like it can continue? Or if they're doing poorly, was it just a blip, or have they just lost the plot? Ladies and gents, is there a last question at the back? Yes, sir. Um, what happens in the event of your death? Um, your beneficiaries, do they get um, taxed? Yeah. So on the event of your death, the tax-free savings account will be liquidated, and there will be no tax payable on the profits that you have made. However, that pile of money then goes into your estate. And if you've got above a certain amount, and I'm not sure what it is, be sorry? So if you've got more than 7.5 million, there's a state duty to pay. But if you've, so then it forms part of your estate. And next say you're worth 10 million on death, then you'd get taxed on the excess. If you're only worth 3 million, no tax. So it simply forms part of your estate. The initial pool will come out tax-free, but then it just goes in and it's part of your asset base that you have. Ladies and gents, I've run time, so I'm going to park it there. Certainly, you're welcome to uh, come and ask me more questions. You can contact me. If you've got more questions, drop me an email. I go back to my key point. Open a TFSA. Now, let's all go watch Sono. Thank you very much for your time this evening. <laughs>